What's up, everybody? Welcome to the weekend roundup. So much happening this weekend. Two big time matchups in Europe MLS playoffs and WSL playoffs. I'm going to get to all of it here, starting with Manchester City, Liverpool. Liverpool get the win. And there's really one po big point I want to get to here. But before that, I want to acknowledge once again Jurgen Klopp's man management motivation abilities are unmatched. It is the single greatest, for all of the tactics and all of the other things he does so well, it is the single greatest gift he has. It doesn't matter how bad things get relatively speaking, for Liverpool. You saw it when they had all of those injuries and fell apart for a while there, rallied thanks to that Allison goal, got themselves in the Champions League. Now they're sitting in the middle of the Premier League table. Nothing seems to be going right. You got injuries again. And for all of the issues this team has, they continue to show up and battle. It doesn't always go their way at this point. They are flawed. But time after time, they continue to rise to the occasion. They continue to deliver the kind of performances you expect from them. It is, to me, just one of those things that doesn't get appreciated enough. So I wanted to acknowledge that first because Liverpool were great in this game. They could have had two or three more goals if they would have squared the ball. I mean, Mo Salah had a couple he could have squared. I don't necessarily fault him. I'll explain why in a minute. And Darwin Nunez had the one... He could have sent over to Salah. Also want to acknowledge, Mo Salah had a phenomenal pass for Diogo Jota that nearly resulted in a goal too. And defensively, they were much better. It was just a what you expect from Liverpool. They look like the two best teams in England again. Which is a credit to these kind of players, their ability to rise to the occasion, to Jurgen Klopp for just finding a way to get, get this team to believe them, continue to believe in themselves. Because this easily could have spiraled. And there are bad stretches. It happened the last time they were down. And it's happened already this season. It has not been pretty. But they just find a way to keep fighting. And ultimately find a way to win this game. And now Mo Salah is scoring goals again. He probably could have had at least two assists in this game. One, if Jota would have finished that, and the other coming from situations where he decided to shoot the ball on two-on-ones and things like that. I also just would rather have Mo Salah be selfish and aggressive. Because the Mo Salah you saw in this game was a confident Mo Salah. And you need a confident Mo Salah for him to impact games and be the player he's supposed to be and the player he's paid to be. He doesn't give you 400 different things on the field, right? He's not a defensive <laughs> wizard who covers all of this ground. Yes, he gives you 8 to 10 assists a season. You saw it with the pass he had in this game. But he is a goal scorer. That is what he does. He's not going to impact the game all these other different ways. You need him taking players on and wrecking havoc on the wing. And that doesn't happen if he's thinking about things. And obviously, he hasn't had a good start to the season. But when he got those opportunities in this game, coming off of his obliteration of Rangers, <laughs> he was taking those shots. And those shots were on target. Now, or one of them was just wide. One of them, Ederson got a hand to. And then, of course, that next opportunity, you just knew that one was going in. Terrific piece of skill to get himself 1v1 with all that open field. And there was just no doubt in your mind. I'm not sure that's the case two weeks ago. But he feels like himself again. He's playing like himself again. And he gets the decisive goal in this game. I've talked about Liverpool's struggles. I've also now just talked about Liverpool's resilience and why I just refuse to give up on this team no matter how bad things get. I just think they're going to find a way because Jurgen Klopp always does. Does this mean they're a title contender? No. They need to do a lot more for me to believe they can close this gap 
and really become a factor. I've said from the very beginning of their struggles, this is about trying to find a way to get to the Champions League. If they do that, it's a successful season considering everything that's going on here. And, you know, they're in position to get through to the knockout stage of the Champions League. Nothing disastrous has happened as long as they finish top four and don't blow the position that they're in right now, Champions League-wise. And you just chalk it up to season didn't go our way. We had some injuries. We'll regroup and go again next season. The real point I want to make off of this game is Manchester City. We have got to stop acting like this team is invincible and miles ahead of every other team in the world and that it's not fair because you just can't beat them and they're going to obliterate every single team they play and I don't see any way anybody can stop them. Manchester City are averaging fewer points per game in the Premier League since those two seasons where they won 100 points in 98 back-to-back, 2017-18, 2018-19. Since then, they're averaging fewer points than five of the last six Premier League champions, and that includes 2016-17 Chelsea, who were good, but nobody is talking about them as one of the best teams in Premier League history. The exception, the one team that was aver- that averaged fewer points than Manchester City have over the past, what is that, 19, 20, 2021, three plus seasons, if I did my math right, was 2020-21 Manchester City. It wasn't the Liverpool team that won. It wasn't the Chelsea team that won. The bar is incredibly high. They very well may be the best team in the world. They're still my pick to win the Champions League. I've talked about how I feel about Holland and the difference he makes for this team. But they are not going and putting up 100 points a season. They haven't been. They did it once and then they nearly did it again. And since then, they have been vulnerable. And I didn't mention in those five of the last six champions to average more points in that season than City have since those two incredible campaigns they put together. There's also, you know, the Liverpool teams who also averaged more points than that and happen to be on, you know, come up just short. These are some of the best teams in Premier League history, but these are not the... These City teams are are not the best in Premier League history. If you want to argue 17, 18 was... Or 18, 19, I'm willing to have that conversation because those teams basically didn't drop points. They were comp- It's impossible to keep up with that rate. I will concede that. But think about this, right? So Manchester City have work to do to catch Arsenal. Manchester City have already dropped seven points. Manchester City have not played a game against the other three teams currently in the top four. They dropped points against Aston Villa. They just lost to Liverpool. Now, Liverpool is a little bit of an exception in the sense that they've had success against Manchester City. They have a team pretty comparable skill-wise. They're not your traditional middle-of-the-table Premier League team, obviously. And, you know, Newcastle played with them, who, again... A little bit of strange circumstances there, but I don't I don't see them finishing in the Champions League spot this season. Chelsea are flying. They could take some points off Manchester City. Absolutely, we need to see what Arsenal can do. And Tottenham have had a success a history a recent history of success against Manchester City. It's always possible they reel off 20 straight wins. But I don't see it happening. They set an incredibly high bar, like I mentioned before. I will continue to harp on, you have to play for three points every single game if you're going to try and beat them and try and keep pace with them. Because every drop point is a disappointment. There are no good draws against this Manchester City team. But they can be beat. And we have to... Yes, you... I will continue to pick Manchester City most of the seasons to win the Premier League. But this idea that it is done and dusted and there is no way anybody can ever keep up with them, we have got to stop with it because it is false. Look at the numbers they are actually putting up from a points-per-game standpoint. 
It is not impossible to do that. It's incredibly difficult. But the way Arsenal are going, and I know there was some controversy in that game, it was probably their worst game of the season so far. It is possible, especially if they get at least one win against Manchester City. I'm just tired of... There's no way anybody can beat City. There's no way anybody can beat PSG. There's no way anybody can beat Bayern. Liverpool have beaten City, and these City teams are not producing points at the same rate. Granted, Liverpool is not either. I mean, the bar is just going to be lower this season. PSG just failed to win League 1 a couple of seasons ago. And Bayern are struggling, probably still going to win the Bundesliga. But I'm so, I'm so tired of just writing these teams in pen. If you want to pencil them in, fine. Am I going to pick all three of them every season? Probably. But we have to acknowledge the nuances of this city project and acknowledge that every city team is not the same. Even with Erling Holland, this team is dropping points. And they haven't even played the best teams in the league yet. You have to be great to keep pace with them. But you can do it. Doesn't mean win. I'm not saying Arsenal is going to win. <clears throat> All I'm saying is it is possible. We have to treat Arsenal like a contender until they're not. Because the pace Manchester City is setting is simply not high enough if that's the right word, they're not picking up points at a high enough rate where nobody can catch them. For two seasons, they did that. But since, they have been much more like a very good champion than an all-time great team that nobody can touch. So can we please start ex acknowledging that reality and talking about them that way? I know about the money. I know they still are on paper way better than everybody else. But it is not a foregone conclusion. They are just going to waltz through this league every season. Go look at the numbers. Now on to El Clasico. Real Madrid ultimately come away with a 3-1 win. The first thing I will say here is this game was decided by Barcelona's defensive mistakes and inability to close players down. The one big lapse in judgment was, uh, yeah, when Vinicius is, you know, wide, probably want to know where he is. <laughs> and the right side of the Barcelona defense just lost him. And then Ter Stegen makes a good save, but Kareem Benzema is there to put him in the back of the net. Those are the kind of moments that can decide games like this. You just, you got to know where he is and you got to account for him. He's one of the best players in the world and one of the fastest. There really isn't too much to say about that other than that one is on, you know, that right side of the Barcelona defense. And you also, you know, a couple situations with Kareem Benzema that didn't ultimately result in, result in goals that were actually, that actually, you know, stood and counted where... Barcelona just didn't cover that space and close players down the way they needed to. Federico Valverde scores a really good second. So it's 2-0. You feel like this thing is over. But then Barcelona really pulled themselves together. They get the goal back. Didn't come especially close to getting a second. If you look at shots, shots on target, expected goals, all that stuff, they'll tell you Barcelona was the better team. And I do feel like Barcelona comes away from this feeling like they deserve a point. And it ended 3-1 because of the penalty on Rodrigo. That is not a penalty for me, number one. And number two, that is absolutely not a clear and obvious error. I thought we were actually going to start applying that the way it was, you know, what the words actually mean. And every time I think that, something like this happens, and now I'm just all confused again. 
I have no idea what the VAR bar, if you will, is. So, to me, this should have been 2-1. What I want to say is, you know, Barcelona, they cost themselves at least one of these goals and some of the bigger moments in the game came straight from Barcelona mistakes. Real Madrid have just not been, yes, they consistently find ways to win, but they have not been all that impressive this season. It's a lot of one-goal victories, some late drama. It's, it's not like they're running away with this thing. You know, Barcelona's been the team that's been way more impressive in La Liga. I just wonder how this game would have gone had Barcelona not come into it, having spent, you know, the past couple days wallowing in the realities of what happened against Inter because the leadership at the club decided to bet their financial future on this team being a Champions League contender and the best team in Spain. I don't know if it would have made a difference, but you were hearing people say things like, yeah, it's difficult to come into El Clasico after what just happened. And that is not just because they lost an important game or you know drew an important game in the Champions League that ended up essentially being a loss for all intents and purposes. It's because nobody wants to hear about improvement. Nobody wants to hear about this being a project that Chavi keeps referring to, and he's absolutely right. When everybody knows this is not being treated like a project, this is being treated like a team that should be competing to win a Champions League title, who's probably going to go out in the knockout, in the group stage. They're not supposed to be at Real Madrid's level right now. Look at the gap between those two teams eight months ago, or when Xavi took over, which is getting close to being the same thing, but you get the point. I know I saw this morning that you know Ronald Koeman had a better win percentage in his first 50 games than, than Xavi, and I will also point out, you know, Xavi was Champions League and then knockout stages Europa League, then a really tough Champions League group. They are much better, and they're proving it in La Liga. From a consistent week-to-week -week standpoint, they are significantly improved under Xavi. I will stand by that. And also, by the way, look at the end of Ronald Koeman and the run of results that ended up leading to the managerial change. They show up every single week in La Liga, and they showed up in this game. They weren't spectacular. They didn't deserve to win. But the entire narrative surrounding this of course, parts of it has to do with the fact that this is just Barcelona. But the other part of this is, I think we'd be talking about it differently if there wasn't this large, dark cloud looming over it, which is the financial situation that these players were not involved in creating and not involved in deciding how they were going to solve it. Solve it. And they were basically told, yeah, our solution is you're just going to, I mean, <laughs> they're just, logic tells you the team that Chavi inherited is not going to become a top three team in the world capable of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with PSG, Manchester City, and Real Madrid in a year. It's just a completely unrealistic expectation. That's putting it nicely. Final thing I'll say on this game. Yes, this tips the balance in favor of Real Madrid, absolutely. If Barcelona had gotten a point, we'd be having a very different conversation about La Liga. But this is not over. I believe week to week what Barcelona have been doing in this league. It, it's the same situation, or at least very similar to the one they found themselves in the Champions League. You can afford the bad result on the road as long as you get the win at home. And that was what happened against Inter. They didn't get the win. If you get the rematch and you take all three points, all of a sudden you're right back in this thing. You just got to keep pace and keep putting pressure on Real Madrid until then. And I think they can do it. I'm not convinced they're going to. If you ask me who wins, I'm going to pick Real Madrid at this moment in time. But this is not over. 
on to domestic playoff soccer, starting with MLS. I'm not going to sort of go through all of the games here. I'm going to save more of that for the later rounds of the MLS playoffs. One thing I do want to point out here, though, and the big takeaway for me for this weekend. In every single game, all four of them, the team with the better attack, more goals scored during the regular season won. Whether that was the LA Galaxy finding a way through and getting their goal, sort of just, you know, it wasn't a spectacular offensive performance, but Ricky Pooch was really good, and eventually they get they get their winner. Montreal also took them a little while, had to survive a little bit, but they get one goal at a penalty in the final seconds of the game, and they're through. Ismail Kone, by the way, fantastic, fantastic player. If you have not seen him play, appreciate him while he's in Montreal. He's not going to be there long. Well, to me, what was even more interesting is the other two games. RSL, two goals up in something like 15 minutes. I think the penalty came in the 14th. And again, it's not like Austin were inspiring offensively. But they have so many weapons. They get a goal back. You know, they think they have another one. Ultimately, they get this penalty. Incredibly unlucky, but a penalty. And prevail in, in the penalty shootout. They needed that attack to be able to come back. And then, same thing with FC Cincinnati. You go down a goal on the road. And what happens? Your big-time players show up. And Brandon Vasquez just runs right by Aaron Long to get you a winner. Drenner, not a great MLS playoff debut, but you survive it. And so, yes, I understand it was three of the favorites and three of the teams at home. But a less dynamic Offensive team is not getting out of that game in Austin. And I'm not convinced a less dynamic team going forward is able to overcome that deficit against the New York Red Bulls, who are one of the best defensive teams in the league this season. And yes, Austin got the help of the Rubio Rubin red card, but it was just a bunch of hopeful crosses and they didn't, they didn't do very much with the ball. You're going to have weird things happen in the playoffs. You have got to be able to adapt to different situations. You can't just, want, you know, Montreal kind of got to do the, finally we'll get our goal and we'll just sort of see the game out. You're not going to be able to do that every single game. Austin, maybe in the next round that happens for him. But to get to the, the business end of this tournament, you have got to be able to overcome these kind of situations. And you look at Nashville and Orlando. Nashville. Not particularly dangerous after they conceded. Orlando didn't really come close to getting a goal back either. It's the difference between the very top of this league and these other teams that made the playoffs. And what makes Cincinnati so interesting? You have got to be able to have, and right, this is one of my core tenets when I'm talking about playoffs. You have got to be really good. You don't have to necessarily be world beaters in attack, but you have got to be able to score goals. You got to have multiple difference makers out there. Nashville has one in attack. Orlando maybe has one. Whereas Austin's got, you know, two or three and Montreal doesn't necessarily have that guy, but between Kai Kamara, Jordi Mihaljevic, Ismail Kone, Lapa Linen, Ramon Kyoto when he's healthy. Their midfield is not necessarily a bunch of, you know, Lucho Acosta creative number 10s. Mihailovic kind of falls into that category. But they are dynamic. They are impact players. And so you spread it around a little bit and you're not relying on one guy to do everything like Nashville is. And so the three best, the three teams with the better attacks win in round one. That... It's not all you need to be successful. I'm not convinced that's going to mean these teams are going to find themselves going incredibly deep. 
especially my concern with Cincinnati and, well, Cincinnati in particular, Austin a little bit, is defensively. They're vulnerable. But if that situation was flipped, you're not seeing these comebacks. But having the kind of offensive firepower Austin and Cincinnati do allows you to go down a goal, or in the case of Austin, two, and find a way back to survive because that's what this is all about. In the NWSL, Kansas City current get an early penalty. Sophie Schmidt scores a really good goal for Houston. And in the final final seconds of the game, with almost the last kick, Kansas City gets their winner over Houston in Houston to advance. And then in the game that felt like it might never end, <laughs> San Diego Wave fall behind early on a bad, bad mistake from Kaylin Sheridan. Just kind of leaves the ball out there. I I think she was just trying to... She thought she got more on it than she did. Trying to pass it out of the back, and it just died. And so there's Yuki Nagasato. And all of a sudden, it's one nothing. Eventually, they get their goal back. Goes to extra time. And who else but Alex Morgan... OSNA is going to want that one back, I would think. But that was the one decisive moment. And really, what made the difference in this game was San Diego Wave subs. They were, all of them, pretty much were spectacular, especially the ones in the attack. Sophia Jakobsen was causing all kinds of chaos. They just had the fresh legs and the better impact players, the better difference makers coming off of the bench, which is... Partially because of all the injuries Chicago has suffered this season. And partially just a testament to the team Joe Ellis has built in San Diego. Where you have, you can bring a Sophia Jakobsen off the bench. That, that is incredible for a team in year one as a franchise, as an expansion team. So they get the win. Your semifinal matchups, Kansas City at OL Reign, San Diego Wave at Portland Thorns. Really looking forward to those as well as the rest of the MLS playoffs. That is all for the weekend roundup. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. I'll see you next time.